So thank you very much for inviting me to Berlin. I love this city and this is a great conference. Uh, and I'm happy to report actually something which uh, is related to the uh, theme of the conference. Uh, so I will uh, uh, describe some recent work. In fact, the, uh, our first paper on this subject appeared today, uh, together with my current student, Shin Anju. Um, and uh, it's um, sort of a subject that I uh, have worked on for many years. It was my, the first problem I worked on as a graduate student. And so uh, I don't know how to feel about it, whether it's taking so many years to solve it or whether it's nice to go back to something I did long ago. Um, so the, um, I probably don't need to emphasize to this audience how uh, wonderful uh, any of Supreme Mills theory is as a, as a theoretical laboratory. And of course, in the planar limit, uh, you will tell me that the theory is integrable uh, and so uh, we should know everything about it. But that's, of course, far from being the case. Um, we would expect naively that integrability gives us full analytic control, but in practice, um, computations are extremely hard. And uh, in practice, then, uh, for most of servers you care about, we really don't know the answers yet. And so there is, I think, a, a strong case to be made that knowing the answer in principle is not uh, the same as knowing the answer uh, explicitly. And um, a rather dramatic illustration of this fact is, a, is the following. Some of the most natural observables you may want to consider, uh, which are uh, correlation functions of local uh, operators uh, that are 1-up BPS, uh, are essentially unknown. So the cases for two and three point functions are trivial. Those are non-renormalized, they're given by the three level answer. But the moment you take n greater or equal than four, we know very little about these objects. Certainly we know very little about them for arbitrary values of the top coupling lambda. Uh, and I think uh, we shall not rest, uh, at least this community should not, should keep having conferences every year till you have solved this problem. Found an efficient way to compute uh, endpoint functions of at least 100 BPS operators for any value of the top coupling lambda. Now, um, what's actually really embarrassing uh, is that, okay, integrability, of course, helps us uh, certainly with the spectral problem and hopefully with correlation functions for intermediate values of lambda. But one often hears the slogan that uh, ADSFT gives us a complete solution of the theory in the limit of large top coupling where, uh, again, of course, we are taking the large and limit first. And so we are still in the plenal theory at strong coupling. And this is the limit that the SFT tells us is controlled by classical supergravity. So what could be simple than classical supergravity? Actually, this is an extraordinarily complicated nonlinear theory and calculations are very hard. So even in this limit that is uh, said to be uh, completely tractable, we know uh, preciously little. And so, for example, the uh, correlation function of one half BPS operators that I was uh, describing in the previous slides are uh, very hard. Uh, and uh, only a handful of cases are known explicitly. These are very complicated calculations. I will review uh, in a bit how they are done. But essentially, for equal weights, only three of them are known. And so despite heroic efforts, really, we know uh, close to nothing. And uh, always the optimist, I want to phrase this as an opportunity. Clearly, uh, this beautiful theory must have beautiful answers for these objects. And it's our task to find the right language uh, in which to describe these beautiful answers. So in fact, today I will describe some progress in this direction. In fact, you could call it a complete solution of this problem for four-point functions. So I will find actually an explicit answer for uh, the four-point correlator of one-half BPS operators, again, in the supergravity limit. So this is planar correlators uh, for lambda going to infinity, but for arbitrary uh, external weight PI. 
And so I would say there's a new technical tool, uh, which is a Malian representation of safety correlators. This has been advocated as a correct, uh, or at least as a useful way to study correlation functions, uh, starting with the work of Mark a few years ago and then Penedones and others. Uh, but there's also a new idea, and the idea is that, uh, again, it should not uh, be uh, really news to this audience, but it's the first time I think it's used in this context. The idea is that the calculations have been performed so far so hard because you're insisting in a traditional diagrammatic expansion. But the main lesson, or one of the main lessons of modern approach to gauge theory perturbative amplitude is that simply that is the wrong language. The diagrammatic expansion hides the true simplicity of the final on-shell answer. We should think of uh, holographic correlators as the analog of the S-matrix for ADS. And, and it turns out that that final answer is much simpler than intermediate calculations. And the approach I will take today is to bypass entirely the diagrammatic expansion and determine the final answer by imposing a set uh, of axioms. As I said, there was throughout consistent condition that the final answer should satisfy. So, uh, before I get into uh, telling you the story about Melling and how we fix the correlators, there is a bit of kinematic uh, preliminaries. Um, so, uh, it's useful to deal with uh, these SO6 indices. So, remember, this is a 1 half BPS uh, single trace operator in the symmetric trace representation of the SO6 art symmetry. And it's useful to introduce this auxiliary variable T. T is a six-dimensional vector which, which obeys a null condition. So we contract these indices with this null vector. And because of the vector is null, the um, trace are automatically uh, uh, removed. And so this is the irreducible part of the representation. And in the bulk of my talk, to make uh, formulas a little simpler, I will restrict to the case of equal weights. Uh, and then at the end, I will, I will tell you how the story generalizes for unequal weights. But if you take equal weights, then um, clearly a four-point correlator is, first of all, a function of the four space-time coordinates x1 up to x4, and these uh, four internal coordinates t1 up to t4. But of course, using the global uh, conformal group and the global SO6 symmetry, we can extract this kinematic prefactor and write this as a function of cross ratios. So capital U and capital V are the canonical uh, conformal cross ratios, and sigma and tau are the complete analog of the uh, conformal cross ratios for the art symmetry part. Now, you may be annoyed by the fact that I'm using capital U and capital V. That's against the standard convention where these are denoted by small u and small v, but I will have soon enough a different use for small u, so please keep in mind the cross ratio of capital U and capital V. Now, uh, again, this story is completely standard. This sigma and tau uh, are symmetry cross ratios. However, we should remember that they're just a convenient way to keep track of the SO6 index structure. And so, whereas the dependence on U and V is, is very non-trivial, the dependence on sigma and tau could be just suspended polynomially. And so this object is really just a order P polynomial in sigma and tau, so if you, if you will, all the information is contained in this, uh, however many functions, uh, where you let, let this in this M and N run from zero to P with this constraint. Okay, so, um, so let me now review the conventional approach that I was working on as a, as a graduate student, and then uh, uh, many people uh, here made uh, most of the, uh, of the hard work. Uh, for example, uh, Arutonov and Frolov and others uh, did some of the hardest calculations. So what one is instructing to do, uh, so remember the, we're looking at the four-point function uh, to leading over uh, one over n square order. This is, of course, subleading with respect to the disconnected graph which are of order one, but those are completely trivial, just product of two-point functions which are not renormalized. So this leading planar answer, ads safety tells us, is, can be just computed by a, in principle, straightforward calculation in supergravity. You have to sum within diagrams uh, where you have um, 
cubic vertices that give you quartic type, uh, sorry, give you exchange type diagrams, and you have contact vertices that give you sorry, quartic vertices give you contact type diagrams, and of course you must sum over all possible channels, all possible combinations. It's just a canonical Feynman uh, type perturbation theory, with the only difference that um, these propagators are uh, the appropriate one for ADS. And so the external legs are the so-called ball to boundary propagators, propagators from a point on the boundary little x to a point in the bulk big Z. And the ball to ball propagator for given exchange uh, dimension delta and given spin L propagators from bulk point Z to bulk point W. Uh, these are known functions and also known in principle, in fact this is work by Arturo and Farlov, is the effective action that you obtain by, uh, in ADS5, that you obtain by calusa kran reducing type 2b supergravity on the S5. So, so here we are just doing ADS5 calculations, these vertices are integrated in the ADS5 bulk, but of course we have an infinite tower of KK modes that come from reduction on the S5, uh, and that's what you're supposed to do. So it's straightforward, but in practice very hard. In fact, uh, we need to develop a little bit of language. So these contact width and diagrams with no derivatives are known as D functions. They are function of the external dimension delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, and delta 4. And of course, also the coordinate x1, x2, x3, x4. As always, these are conformal objects. So you can again extract a kinematic prefactor and think of these functions as functions of the two cross ratios, capital U and capital V. And these objects are um, well known. If you take uh, these deltas to be one, this is in fact just a scalar box integral in four dimensions. And then higher values of delta can be obtained by taking derivatives. So these objects are a very canonical series expansions. We know a lot about them. And these are the basic building blocks. In fact, it's a miracle that for, for which I have a partial intuition that I will, will share with you later. But it's a miraculous fact uh, that is not universal. It does not happen in other instances of ADS-CFT, but it does happen for ADS-5 times S5. It's a miraculous fact that uh, all exchange diagrams that you need in this kind of calculations can be written as finite sums of D functions. So at the end of the day, this whole calculation reduces uh, to some complicated final sum of D functions, and that's the answer. So I'm giving you the example for the scalar exchange. Again, for simplicity, I'm taking the four external dimension to be equal to P, and then I'm, in, I'm uh, propagating in the bulk some scalar field with M squared mass that correspond to dimension delta, and then uh, some AKs are some non-coefficients, and this is something that, in fact, we found when I was a graduate student, it turns out that you can write this as a finite sum of D functions as such, with some external adjustment for the weights. And here it's actually quite crucial for this formula to be correct that the um, dimension delta is an even integer. In fact, you can see this clearly that if delta is, for example, is odd, or even worse, if delta is not an integer, uh, this um, summation doesn't make much sense. But it turns out that if you take equal external weights, SO6 selection rules will instantly tell you that the dimension delta of the intermediate guy is actually always even. And so precisely for the kind of couplings, and this generalizes, it's just, it's just a simple synthesis of a much more general phenomenon, precisely for the kind of quantum numbers and couplings that you encounter in the S5 times S5, you have this nice phenomenon that exchange argument truncate to a finite number of the function. This is, for example, not true in ADS4 times S7. And so here is a table that tells you what kind of calusa klein modes can propagate in the middle. So you see there are gauge fields uh, of two types, there are scalars, there are two index tensors with various uh, quantum numbers. This is the twist, which is delta minus j. Uh, and again, the calculation of the quartic couplings uh, was this heroic work by Uturo and Frolov. Uh, just to write that down, it takes 15 pages. And the moment the external weights um, become not even big, but already of the order four or five, this is a horrendous calculation. 
you have to sum a large number of diagrams, uh, you have to do ugly combinatorics, and you can die. Now, in fact, um, there are small hints that the final answer is a little bit simpler than this horrendous intermediate calculation. And so if you write, you have, you have to know what you're doing and to massage things properly and write things in the correct basis. But if you do so, well, the case for p equal to 4 is, is just 14 Ds. Well, that's pretty bad, but still better than the horrendous intermediate sum that you get in this calculation. Okay, but uh, the answers are not transparent at all. I mean, you have no intuition for what the sum of the functions is. Factorization is, OP factorization is on manifest, it's a mess, and clearly you get stuck at low values of P. But of course, you have seen this before. It's precisely the kind of complexity you encounter when you, when you attempt to compute uh, perturbative amplitudes by brute force. If you attempt to compute gluon scattering at already at three level by brute force, you get stuck very soon. But we, now we know better, there are much more efficient on shell methods, and that's what we want to do. So in fact, it's a slogan, but it's a very useful one, that CFT correlators are really the ads -S matrix. So when, when I was drawing these Feynman diagrams before, these Witten diagrams, we should not think of them as diagrams for the analog of an off-shell correlator in field theory. Truly, these are S-matrices. So taking the external leg to be a bulk to boundary propagator is tantamount as putting the external operator on shell. So this is, these are on-shell objects and should expect, much like in perturbative gauge theory amplitude, a drastic simplification when we sum diagrams and write the final on-shell ends. So, in fact, the language that makes uh, uh, this analogy with the S-matrix very transparent is the language introduced by Mac, uh, which is Mellin space. So let me review that. So we start with some uh, endpoint correlator in field theory. In fact, we need to take the connected part, but this connected part as sick Mellin transform. And we define some object M, Roman M, as a function of some dual variable delta ij, and you see the dependence on the core external space-time coordinate xij is here, and the delta ij's are integrated in the complex plane. In fact, these are uh, contours that run in the, in the vertical direction on the imaginary axis. You need to be a little bit careful about the real part of the integration variable, but let me maybe a little schem be schematic at this stage. And uh, this delta, this is a particularly symmetric way of writing the integration variables, uh, and uh, that comes with a bit of a redundancy. So these delta j are symmetric. The diagonal parts are it's convenient to fix them to minus the conformal dimension, and then there is some sort of conservation law that says that for fixed i, if you sum over j, you get zero. So this Roman M in fact, is not quite the Mellin amplitude. It's what Mach called the reduced Mellin amplitude. The Mellin amplitude will come in a couple of slides. Now, the beauty of this representation, and this is a very important point, so ask questions if it's not clear, is that it makes factor OP factorization manifest. So the operator power of expansion tells us that when x1 goes to x2, and these two, these two operators can be expanded in a, in a sum, where OI is a primary and then it comes with derivative, which are descendants, with the characteristic singular power x1 to square to the sum of the external dimension minus the internal one. And then it's clear that in order to reproduce this singularity, m as a function of delta 1, 2 should have a simple pole. If you postulate the Roman m as a simple pole, you can close the contour around the pole, and Cauchy theorem tells you then it will pick up precisely this power. So OPE singularities translate into poles on the real axis for these delta ij variables. And since clearly you can contract operators in various channels, xi going to xj, and you have delta ij variables, which channel OPE you're talking about translates in which particular delta ij variable you're looking in the Roman M. So here for concreteness, I'm looking at the S channel where one goes to two, and then, one can show by simple OPE arguments that 
you will have a simple pole in this capital M with the residue that precisely tells you about the factorization of, of, the, of the endpoint function into a three-point function times the rest. And in fact, you see that each primary, in fact, gives you an infinite tower of poles. These are uh, so-called satellite poles, uh, where this n greater to zero pole come from descendants. So the great news is that this capital M, this, this, uh, this uh, Roman M is a meromorphic function. It's a rather simple analytic properties. It's a meromorphic function. And its factorization property are somewhat reminiscent of the kind of factorization property you would see for a three-level scattering amplitude in flat space. It's not quite the same because here each primary comes with an infinite tower of poles, but morally speaking, it's a meromorphic function. So we can push this analogy further uh, by solving the constraints. I can write this delta j, remember they were symmetric. They obey a conservation condition and a condition that tells me that delta i is minus delta i. So this very much looks like this delta ij are dot products of some momenta, right? Because now by moment of conservation, I, I've solved the constraints. And pi square minus delta i is exactly what you do by saying that p square is on shell equal to minus m square. So the delta i play in this analogy the role of mass squares. And uh, just because we are very familiar with this kind of notation, we can specialize to the case of the four-point function and use this traditional Mendelssohn invariance ST and U, which of course obey this constraint, and then write this reduced Mellin amplitude as a function of two of them, for example, S and T. Or perhaps if you want to write in a more uh, redundant way, but of course we're always using the constraint, sometimes it's useful to write as a function of ST and U. And then I can now translate the statement in the previous slides in this, in this very familiar Mandelstadt type language and say that if I do the S channel OP, which means operator one goes to operator two, I look at the S channel in the conventional sense of what you'd be looking at in an S matrix that is a function of S and T. I look at the dependence of the S matrix on S and I expect to find an infinite sequence of poles at, uh, located at tau of the intermediate operator, tau is the twist of the operator, plus 2n. And what's even more striking is that the residue at each pole is a polynomial in the remaining Mendelssohn variable. So if I look at uh, residues in S, I will find polynomial in T. If I look at residues in T, I will find polynomial in S. If I look at residues in U, I will find equivalently polynomials in, I can think of these as polynomials in S or polynomial in T, which of course are the same thing. And oh, clearly the statement is crossing symmetric. And in fact, the beauty of this is that in this language, this Mellin, reduced Mellin has precisely the crossing properties that you would expect for an S matrix in flat space, okay? So you can, you can, you use your, you tra can translate your intuition about Mandelson variable to this context. Okay, so what Mellin actually, sorry, what Mac actually did and I don't think anybody really understood why he did it, but that's what he did. He didn't quite define the Mellin amplitude to be the Roman M. He said, well, what I want to call the Mellin amplitude is this curly M. And Roman M and curly M are related by just some simple factors of gamma function of these delta IJ variables. So I think he had in mind some, uh, make it, that this language would make simpler certain asymptotic condition he wanted to impose. You can try to, to read what he says in his paper. It's not totally clear why he did that to me, but well, clearly he had some intuition that turns out to be very useful in our context because this is precisely the kind of instruction that you want to do in a large N theory. Let me remind you that a large N, you have a double trace operators which approximately uh, are just factorized. And so, for example, a double trace operator of this kind will have a dimension which is the sum of the dimension plus n plus 2n plus j. And if you look at the twist, given that j is angular momentum, it's delta 1 plus delta 2 plus 2n plus, of course, order one of our big n square corrections. And then the gamma function, uh, we would argue with delta 1, 2 will have precisely the poles that correspond to the exchange of these double trace operators. And the other gamma function will do the same. So by extracting these factors of gamma functions, we are 
automatically take into account the contribution at large n of the double trace operators, and so the upshot is that curly m only contains single trace operators. And so clearly it's, 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 a, it's a natural object to look at at large n. Okay, so that's, that was a review of Mellin. Um, no, this is a little bit stuck. Hmm. Can I do it here? Yes. Uh, so this is dead. It's okay. So um, so now we can uh, we can look in Mellin space at the description of of Witten diagrams. So the first. Uh, slogan that I want you to memorize is that the D functions have a curly M equal to 1. And given that the D functions are the basic building blocks, clearly this explains why Mellin space is such a useful language. Contact diagrams that have uh, 2K space time derivatives turn out to be polynomials in Mellin space of degree K. Um, equal to, you know, where 2k is the number of space-time derivatives. And exchange diagrams are also extremely simple. So in the very general case where I allow for the internal quantum number to be some arbitrary dimension delta and, and spin j, uh, this, is, um, um, this is the general expression. And you can see that the sum over m is a priori unbounded. But uh, where QJM is some polynomial uh, of order J in T and PJ minus 1 of S and T, some polynomial of order J minus 1 in S and T. And, um, and um, it turns out that if you specialize, again, this is a restatement of what I said before, if you specialize for the quantum numbers of ADS5 times S5, this infinite sum, in fact, truncates to a finite number of poles. This is just a translation in Mellin space. Of the fact that, uh, of the fact that, uh, that we have a finite sum of the functions. So, in fact, and this is uh, my attempt to give you some intuition of, about this miracle of truncation to a finite number of poles. If this did not happen, you'd have a, a problem with with the OP interpretation, with the conformal field theory interpretation of the dual supergravity answer. And what must happen, this is, I'm, I'm saying it's a prediction from conformal field theory for the structure of the supergravity answer. What must happen is that the single trace poles never overlap with the double trace poles already contained in the gamma functions. In the case of, thank you, in the case of equal weights, you actually have a gamma function squared. And so you have a double pole at certain locations. And the double pole is a natural thing to have because you can quickly convince yourself that the double pole in S corresponds to a log U term in the, in the position space correlator. And log U's are what, precisely what you expect uh, to interpret in, as over 1 over n square anomalous dimensional double trace operators. But you surely have no use for a triple pole. A triple pole will give you log U squared, and that cannot happen at order 1 over n square. So if this, is whole, if this is going to make any sense, it must be that the single trace poles never overlap with the double trace poles, and so you must have a truncation. OK, so the, the way we are, I'm heading, as I already advertised at the beginning, I'm going to uh, explain a series, a set of abstract algebraic properties, analytic properties that this Mellin amplitude curly M should have. And the goal is to have a sufficient number of properties that will end up characterizing this curly M unique. So from what I've told you so far, it's already apparent that curly M has appropriate crossing symmetry properties. So if there were no art symmetry variable, then it would be the standard crossing symmetry where you just swap minus some variables. But now you, you have to remember that when you, when you swap uh, minus some variables, you also have to swap the quantum numbers of the external operators, and that introduces some additional prefactors of the sigma and tau art symmetry cross ratio. So these are the cross and symmetry statements. They're standard. And then the really constraining statement that I've told you so far is that curly M is an extremely constrained rational function. 
It's a sum of a finite number of poles in all channels with polynomial residues. And we, we can also predict the location of the poles. There has to be a truncation. And by looking at the Kaluza-Klein spectrum, we know precisely that these are the poles that we expect. Okay, so the reasoning here, we can either think of doing calculation in supergravity, and so we know that these are the expected poles because of the exchange fields, or we can think more abstractly, we're just looking at the large lambda limit of planar n equals to four, and so we know, for example, because you told us, the integrability community told us that all uh, single trace operators which are not one half BPS decouple, and so just by, knowledge, by the knowledge of the spectrum at large lambda, we deduce that these are the poles that we must have at large lambda. And each pole is a polynomial in the other variable. So of course, this is a very constrained rational function. Now, the next uh, thing you need to, uh, to keep in mind, of course, is asymptotic behavior for S and T. Because clearly, after all, we know that there is lambda dependence in this four-point function, and we want to somehow tell our, our set of conditions, we want to incorporate a condition that tells that we are just in the supergravity limit. And that condition is a condition on the fact that we start with a type 2B action, which is a two-derivative supergravity action. And so ultimately, it's a condition on, on, on how many derivative couplings and how large are the number of derivatives that can appear in the contact diagrams. Alpha prime corrections give additional derivatives, and those will end up changing the asymptotic behavior in the Mellin amplitude. So, in fact, um, for exchange diagrams, you can argue very directly that the asymptotic behavior for large S and T is at most linear, uh, but because in supergravity, of course, the spin is at most two. That's is graviton in its Kaluza Klein mode, so this guy is linear. This guy is a most quadratic, but there's one over S, so both terms are linear. For contact diagrams, the argument is a little bit more subtle. In fact, in our paper, we we're a little bit too quick. We simply asserted that it's obvious that there is at most two derivative couplings, but a very useful conversation I had during the boat trip last night with Gleb Aryuturnov convinced me that the story is a little bit more subtle. So there is a bit of an extra uh, argument you need. Uh, to say that the, the, the quartic couple contains most two derivatives. This appears to be the case in all cases that have been uh, computed explicitly, and we will simply assume it. So I think there is an indirect consistency argument that comes from the fact that the large uh, S and T limit of the Mellin amp is supposed to give you scattering in flat space, and scattering in flat, in flat space must be dominated by the graviton exchange. So if you had something with more than two derivatives, you'd screw that property. But of course, this is a very indirect argument. It would be nice to have a more direct argument. For us, this will simply be an assumption. We'll assume that the Mellin amplitude scales at most linearly when the arguments are large. OK, so we're almost done. What remains to be done, and in fact, I'm surprised that you didn't stop me earlier, I, when I was considering the constraints on, uh, at, the, at the beginning with my kinematics, I was just imposing invariance of the conformal group, bosonic subgroup of PSU to 2 slash 4, the, the conformal part, the symmetry part. Of course, the odd generators also impose some conditions. And so the last condition we need to impose is the condition of superconformal invariance. And it turns out that that is rather straightforward to state. So this curly G function, which you remember is the function we obtain, it's just a function of the cross ratios after we stripped off this prefactor. We need to perform a little bit of a change of variable. So the U cross ratio becomes E Z bar. V is 1 minus E 1 on Z bar. Sigma is alpha, alpha bar. Tau is 1 minus alpha, 1 minus alpha bar. And in terms of these variables, you, when you set alpha bar equal 1 over z bar, a priori you still get a function of z, z bar, and alpha, but the statement of the superconformal invariant that this fu the function you get is in fact independent of z bar. So that's the constraint imposed by superconformal invariance. You can solve the constraint by writing the g function as something which automatically obeys this condition. For example, the answer in free field theory, that's the thing that is useful for us to extract. 
plus a factor r which vanishes automatically the moment you impose alpha bar equal 1 over z bar. You can see here that this factor is 0 and it multiplies some other arbitrary function of, of the cross ratios and it turns out then that this arbitrary function h uh, contains all dynamical information. Okay, to summarize, we stripped off a kinematic prefactor and then we get to write this g, which is a function of the four cross ratios, as the free part plus some simple factor r times h, and all the information is contained in h. This is the form of the answer that has fully exploited all symmetries of the problem. Now, so what we now must do clearly is translate this position state statement into melding space, but that's actually easy. The preliminary step is to melding transform H. So we're going to do, to do some M tilde, which is the precise analog of M for the connected part of the correlator. So remember that the, the melding transform of the connected part of the correlator is some uh, melding transformation, which I'm now writing in terms of the only two independent variables, S and T, and in terms of the two independent correlations U and B. And these are the gamma functions that mark with some intuition that who knows where I got from, told us to extract. And I'm going to do exactly the same for H in terms of some object M tilde with a very minor tweak. So rather than instructing the function that Mac told me to extract, I'm going to start some slightly shifted set of gamma functions where this u tilde is the same as u minus 4. The point of doing this is a bit of a technical point, but the point of doing this is the factor r that is in front of curly h is not crossing invariant. And this compensates for that in such a way that with this definition, then the crossing properties of m tilde are extremely simple. It's just a way to make crossing more manifest. Okay, so now we're almost there. This is the solution of the, of the superconformable dent that had in position space, and now I just simply melding transform it. The melding transform of the free part gives me essentially nothing. It's some sum of delta function that can be considered in nodes. I will come back to that later if I have time. And so the word identity simply become that the melding a function m, which is what we want to compute, can be written in terms of this auxiliary object m tilde, which is the Mellin transform of h, acted upon the Mellin analog of the factor r. And this looks a little complicated. You see the sigma and tau factors are just the art symmetry uh, variables, and this v hat, u hat, uv hat, u square hat, and v square hat are some different operators. But I promise you, it's completely straightforward. It's exactly what you'd expect. You are multiplying a function in position space, and the function, the dual uh, momentum space or melting space, is then acted upon by different operators. It's a usual story when you go from, from, from position space to momentum space that, that you get a difference operator in the dual space. And this is the Pokhammer symbol. Okay, so we're almost there now because um, the, sorry. Um, the point now is that we have an extremely constrained booster problem. We have four conditions, and our claim is that there is a unique solution. And here it is. So let's unpack it a bit. So we are summing over i, j, and k with this constraint. So in practice, there are only two summations over i and j in a certain range. And m tilde, you see, is a, is a as promised, a polynomial in sigma and tau with very symmetric poles at this location. And, uh, and these are just some combinatorial coefficient. This is trinomial coefficient squared. And this CPPP is some overall constant independent of sigma tau s uh, and t that in principle could be fixed by looking at factorization over protective couplings. Our conditions are homogeneous, so we can hope to fix the overall constant. So that's our proposed answer for equal weights. It passes, it satisfies all consistent conditions, and it reproduces the very complicated uh, super, uh, super result, for example, for p equal to 4. It's as simple as it could be. So remember that the sigma tau expansion is just kinematics. It's a different art symmetry channels. And what we are saying is that for each art symmetry channel, there is 
an ultra simple function of SNT, which is a single factor written like that. Now, um, I promised you the answer for different weights, so now the, the prefactor becomes a little bit more complicated. You need to distinguish cases according to when, uh, according to ranges of, uh, of these external weights, but morally speaking, it's the same as before. With slightly different kinematic prefactor, you still have this function g u v sigma and tau, and this is the answer for different weights. Now we can also we also get uh, to uh, check uh, the the other non case in the in supergravity literature, which is the next to next extremal cases that uh, are unequal weights. So this formula reproduces all honestly calculated supergravity cases, and it's clearly right. So, um, so the, um, there is an independent position space method that I don't have time to go into. Let me uh, end with some questions. So first of all, we would like to prove this formula, either by making this axiomatic approach truly rigorous and, and show that the answer is unique. Perhaps, if you are very strong, you can take uh, a Newton and Fraud of effective action and compute by brute force. Clearly, we'll need some streamlining of the calculation, which is otherwise horrendous. But now that you have a target for what the final answer should like, perhaps one can do it. Uh, also, you see, I, I got the answer by this axiomatic approach. I, I, I impose a set of conditions and solve for them. But there may be a more constructive approach, analogous to the BCFW recursion relations in gauge theory. And that, of course, would be uh, the, the way to go if you want to generalize this to higher endpoint. I focus on the superconformal primaries. In, for four-point function, there's a unique structure in superspace. So in principle, our answer also tells you about super descendants, but not automatically. You have some work to do. So perhaps there is some mileage to be obtained by rewriting this in a more, in a more superspace type language, also with theta variables. That's also useful for amplitudes in gauge theory. Of course, we want to now start thinking about moving away from lambda equal infinity, alpha prime corrections amount to, uh, to relax in this asymptotic condition that I had imposed that the behavior is linear for large S and T. And in fact, it's also interesting to look at perturbative results, which are not up to three loops in position space. And um, it, I think it's a worthwhile exercise, perhaps more than an exercise, a worthwhile uh, research uh, problem to Melding transform those answers and see whether we can recognize some patterns in matching from weak to strong coupling. Uh, we got very similar results for ADS7 times S4, so those will appear eventually. ADS4 times S7, I was hinting at earlier, is infinitely harder because you don't have this nice miracle of the truncation, and then these, these in melding spaces are not rational functions anymore. But perhaps one can make progress. And so my conclusions are that the answer we got truly is as simple as you could have hoped in your wildest dreams. It's a nice surprise. I, I, I want to, uh, perhaps, um, it's a bit of a stretch, but I want to claim that this is the analog of the Park-Taylor formula for uh, MHV amplitudes. It encodes a very large number, the sum of a very large number of final diagrams in a, in a really simple final answer. And so my hope that this is the beginning of an analogous story for, for uh, these uh, holographic correlators of, of the very rich story that, uh, that has been uncovered in recent years for perturbative gauge theory amplitudes. Of course, you want to do higher points. You want to do to perhaps loops. You want to see whether this nice geometric structure, clearly there, you, you, can get, you can keep busy for years if, if truly there is a structure here, which I think there must be given how simple the final answer we got is. Thank you. Uh, you, you, you could try, yes, so we haven't. Uh, of course, in this approach, you, you need a supergravity dual. So you need, you'd, I mean, this, uh, this is really done at strong coupling. 
So it's, it's, it's something that would work for theories where you have an analogous decoupling of anything but the protected operators, single trace operators, which is not very common in field theory. I mean, it's basically n equals to four and its immediate cousins. Sorry, um, no, there's no cuts in many space. So the point is that uh, ADS is a box, and so moment are discretized. And so even loop diagrams only have, uh, loop diagrams are also meromorphic. No, well, I don't know what you get, but uh, you will get, you will still get, you will still get a, uh, yeah, you will still get now an infinite, you will, uh, yeah, you will now get an infinite number of, of, uh, of poles, but um, it will still be discrete. Right, meromorphicity, meromorphicity is universal, but, yeah. but what will change, so the, the fact that we are summing over a finite number of, uh, of poles, of course, is only correct in a supergravity limit or in the supergravity limit plus, alpha prime cor plus any finite number of alpha prime corrections. It's clear that f finite number of alpha prime corrections is not going to introduce any string state of finite mass. It will just renormalize the effective, it will just change effective action. So two all orders in the alpha prime expansion, you are still going to find uh, the same, the same uh, structure of poles. You will not see mass. So in other terms, the, the appearance of mass in cessation on this two point of view is, is non-perturbative in alpha prime. But of course, if you actually work at finite lambda, then, uh, then uh, massive cessation will contribute additional poles. And of course, you have an infinite tower of them. So yes, it's always meromorphic, but but of course, a true simplifying feature here is not only it's meromorphic, it's a rational function. It's a rational function with polynomial residues. So that's something you really have no excuse not to find explicitly. Basically, you answered my question before asking it. I, have, I wanted to clarify whether the existence of a finite number of poles is just in the supergravity limit. It's a supergravity limit plus alpha. In print, if you start applying alpha, uh, uh, add alpha prime corrections, uh, it will still be true, but only perturbative in alpha prime, not. Now, um, but then, nevertheless, it's, I think it's a very interesting question to ask what happens a weak coupling. Is meddling space a useful language, a weak coupling or not? I don't know. Yeah, in order to get uh, the actual correlator, you need also to choose an integration contour. You can go to course, and then you have to choose a contour. And my question is related to extreme operators, because for extreme operators, you can That's right. single trace and double trace, and it seems like we have an ambiguity, but uh, we can get, say, for over to Right, okay, so, so extreme correlators, of course, are, are known, there is an ambiguity, you're right, but it's the same ambiguity that you have at, at zero coupling. It's a statement that, that uh, you can, uh, you, you get a two leading order, already in the planar uh, answer, uh, you get to change the answer by in a mixture of single and double trace operators. But in some sense, it's a little bit boring because the, the correlator is still non, non renormalized as a function of GM mills. And so it, it's the ambiguity that you have a, a weak, at zero coupling. The, that, that ambiguity you do have. If you note the um, um, range that I have here, um, extreme correlators M tilde is just zero, which is exactly what you'd expect because M tilde captures the dynamical part of the correlation function. So is this is the statement that H is zero. This is also true in, actually in the next to extremal case. And in order to get something on trial, you have to go to next to next to next, uh, in which case this is a single sigma tau monomial, so it's very simple. And, then, and that, of course, is, it's not a coincidence that is a calculation that people were able to do in supergravity because uh, you are like as close to uh, protected as possible. And so you get some selection rules that just give you a, a small number of couplings. So in some sense, the hardest case is the one of equal weights. 
uh, from a super gravity viewpoint, the one you, you studied. Uh, and anyway, so yes, you're right. If you want to reproduce this free part, which in this language is just a sum of monomials in, uh, in U and V, uh, you have to do an inverse melding. So going from the position space to this melding transform is completely unambiguous, you just integrate. But going back, uh, you have to choose uh, uh, the integration lines, uh, which are for imaginary uh, S and T, in the so-called fundamental strips, which are the values of the real part such that the original melding transform was convergent. If I just hand you the answer uh, for, uh, for the melding transform, you actually a priori don't know which integration uh, you have to pick. And, but in some sense, it's a small ambiguity. Different choice of contours will just pick up a fine number of poles that precisely give you these monomials in U and V which correspond to the free part. So the statement is that the correct choice of contours will automatically produce this free piece. Right, so as we were discussing yesterday also with Gleb, uh, it's true that uh, at the level of the action, uh, there's no field definition, at least no obvious field definition you can make to, re to eliminate those couplings, but when you actually compute the on-shell object, there are various sums over, uh, over uh, different art symmetry uh, contributions, and in all cases that have been uh, explicitly calculated, those four derivative couplings happen to vanish. It's not a theorem, it's an observation. Uh, for us, it's, a, it's an input to the calculation. We simply assume uh, that this will always be the case, and if under that assumption, you get this result. But this result, I mean, you look at it, you know it's right. So by, uh, by the usual um, opposite logical error, errors that physicists love, clearly this means that those uh, four derivative couplings must be absent when appropriately Treated. <laughs> Sorry? I don't think they vanish. So well, we, uh, they vanish in the precise uh, sense that I stated. So they don't vanish, they no, don't contribute to unshared. Uh, we actually use the uh, equations of motion. Uh, right, but, uh, the but the you, could, you, the you, could, you, could have, you could make your, this object in your own calculations. Uh, when you computed uh, explicit correlators, and although those. No, 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 no. I mean, this talks range for some particular configurations, for some particular operators. Yeah, if you choose them properly, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, but it's a different. Right, so my, uh, my statement is that they, they will always vanish. We can, we can buy the bottle of wine. Well, you can easily check it. No, it's very hard to check. That's the point. Sorry, you want to now consider uh, some limit where you take the external state to be very massive and get some, uh, some uh, classical area result? Yeah, so um, you, can, you can try that, but I don't think that that limit is captured by my answer, because in my answer it was crucial to assume that I was taking the larger limit first. So here, I'm always in the regime where the, the external uh, weights are much more than n. So I'm doing the large N expansion first and computing this four-point function of single test of which fix P. If you want to start taking P of the order N or words N square, then it's a different calculation that is not covered by, by this. But yes, it's a good question. 